All right, we're live. That was the fastest go live ever. Usually it takes like a good 30 seconds. Hey, we're live. I'm going to play this intro music stuff and then we can get this show on the road. Iron Sysadmin Podcast, your source for IT news, commentary, and a healthy dose of paranoia. Hey folks, welcome to episode 39 of the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. Tonight, I am not joined by any of our usual hosts because they're all slackers, or they have jobs, or wives, or families, or whatever. None of those are more important than this show, right? Right, We've Charles? Got those. We've got those. <laughs> I know we have jobs and fail. I came from a <laughs> T-ball game to get this show going. <laughs> so instead, I am joined by a coworker and uh, a web guy, or I don't know, whatever you prefer to be called, web slinger. How about that? You want to be compared to Spider Man? Probably yeah, not so much. Kind of. I don't know. I'm something of an, op- of an ops guy these days, but only in my spare time. You're a dev ops guy. Can we say yeah. that? Can we say I, DevOps? Sure. I mean, it, it's our podcast. I mean, not your podcast. Indeed. I think we Indeed. can do whatever we like, right? So I didn't know if that conjured some sort of a ops demon or dev demon. Anyway, this is Charles. Hi. <laughs> so uh, we were going to have Dustin, but Dustin got pulled away by work. Um, Jason didn't even try to make it. He got something going with his, I don't know, wife or family or whatever. Slacker. I don't know, but he, he checked in on Untapped on Twitter like 10 minutes ago. So he's out drinking without the podcast. Yeah. He's cheating on us. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, speaking of drinking, I'm going to be drinking a lot on the show tonight because it's really hot in my attic slash office where I'm recording from. You're lucky I'm wearing a shirt, folks. Yes, we are. Very lucky. All right, so shall we get into the news? We've got a couple interesting articles tonight. Uh, first of which from Bloomberg, which, uh, by the way, it's reminding me that I only have nine free articles remaining unless I subscribe. So, folks, don't reload the page too many times. Oh, so I'm at eight. You're at eight. Apparently, you read Bloomberg, Bloomberg once more often than I do. Maybe you refresh the page. <laughs> So anyway, according to Bloomberg, Bloomberg, I'm saying it wrong now, the uh, the new Sony CEO talking about moving away from devices and into uh, media content, basically streaming games, game uh, uh, subscriptions, I suppose, uh, streaming uh, movies and whatnot. And uh, I I find this kind of a shock. Sony's been all about their hardware vision for like ever. Now all of a sudden... Shift to media. I guess they're uh... anyway. I guess they've realized that media is where it's at. You have anything to uh, to add there, Charles? You broke up really badly while you were doing that, and I can't tell if it's you or me. It could be either of us. This is the this is what plagues our show. <laughs> Some someday I'm going to get a dedicated internet connection just to record the show on, so no one can blame me anymore. I mean, yeah, it, it, it yeah, it's interesting to see Sony, you know, certainly which I tend to think of as a hardware company, moving away from hardware. But I mean, that's not that unusual. Um, you know, you think of IBM. I mean, IBM was a hardware company, but they ditched that because the profit margins weren't great, and they they just do services, and uh, they're doing pretty well. Yeah, um, yeah, they they did. They slowly but surely ditched every piece of their hardware line. I think all they have now is mainframe, isn't it? Yeah, I think I don't know. Yeah, you know, they spun off stuff that wasn't necessarily unprofitable, but just like, and I don't pretend to understand this logic, but the, the profit margin wasn't enough to justify still doing it. I guess because like Lenovo took the laptop line; they're making money off of it. Um, yeah, exactly. You no, know, I. GE, um, GE owns the biggest freight locomotive line in the country. Like they make most of the world's like rail locomotives. They're spinning it off. 
it's profitable. It's actually more profitable than some of the other stuff they're doing, but like they don't, they don't want it to be part of the company. Hmm. They're going to spin it off to somebody else. I don't know if it's like an overhead. I'm sure it all has to do with businessy stuff that I don't fully understand, but Mm. yeah, I mean, Sony, I mean, Chinese electronics essentially was, is, is what this comes down to Chinese or are they Japanese? It's uh, Sony Japanese. Sony, Sony Japanese. Sony's Japanese. Sorry. Japanese electronics is what, I mean, it's sort of the, the stuff of eighties legend, right? Mm-hmm. You have your Sony Walkman making way to the Sony Discman. Uh, they had those data discs for a while. Do you remember those? They're like oh, a the, uh, mini discs, mini discs. Yeah. yeah. yeah I uh, never had and, one. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, quite, they didn't quite catch on CD killed them. I think. Yeah, I've got uh, a Sony Blu-ray player downstairs. Right, right. It's pretty solid. It's DVD and Blu-ray players. I mean, the PlayStation line that didn't even that didn't even hit me at first when I started reading this article. And then they mentioned yeah. it in the article, PlayStation. Well, what's going to happen to PlayStation? <laughs> like that's got to be a money maker, doesn't it? Doesn't that lead into their their game content? It does. Um, so yeah, I'll be curious to see. I mean, the article mentions. PlayStation 5. So you would expect that they're not going to spin that off. Um, right. Po- but possibly because you say it can be a could even be a loss leader for enabling other revenue streams. Supposedly this is what Microsoft does with the Xbox. The Xbox is made as as cheaply as it can be to maintain quality and sold with just a high enough margin to make it profitable. And then where they make their money is on the Xbox Live subscription, right? And the and the game sales, because software face it. I mean, once you once you get past the development costs of software, it's all profit. Yeah. Except for you know printing discs or whatever. How much can that possibly cost? That's got to be a couple cents a disc, right? And you're probably not even printing that many discs anymore. What's the yeah, last right. What's the, what's the last game you physically bought? Yeah. Yeah, well, I have a Nintendo Switch now, so I have to buy games because they come on cartridges. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Speaking of Japanese media companies. Yeah, listen, the kids love it. For for kids gaming, you cannot beat Nintendo. That's just all there is to it. Nintendo is a kids gaming platform. And they have Zelda. So, I mean, come on. I like Zelda. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so moving on. Bleeping Computer tells us that there are several advocacy groups, and they've got a list here, that want to break up Facebook because they claim Facebook is a monopoly. So this harkens back to, you know, communication giants of the past, which is why I added that to the intro at the beginning. Uh, My problem with this is, so they're claiming Facebook is a monopoly, and they they say they want to see... Let's see, where is it? There's a list of the services they want to split out. It's like Messenger and Instagram and WhatsApp split away from Facebook. And my problem with that statement is that they're not the only game in town. Isn't that what makes you a monopoly? Yeah. I mean, leaving aside the legal definition, it's like you're, if you're at the point where not only is there not really any competition, but your very dominance in the market precludes um, competition. I mean, that was the knock on Microsoft in the 90s. You know, you refer to Microsoft antitrust trials, just that Microsoft right. not only own, you know, own the substantial part of the desktop market, and for all that, they still do, but that they were using it to control the software market on the desktop, particularly web browsers. Yeah, but I mean, Microsoft had things in place at the time where if you purchased a new PC, it was required to come with Windows. It was part of the agreement they had with the manufacturers. Yes. Right? So, I mean, that, sure, you've got a choice, but you're still paying for Windows. Sure, you could get your machine, bring it home, wipe it out, and put whatever the heck you want on it, but then you won't be able to interoperate with any of your friends and you have you will have paid for a license for Windows, regardless of whether you want to run it or not. And I think that was really part of the core of what made that lawsuit hold some weight. Yeah. In this case, Facebook is a, I mean, free to cost service, right? You don't pay for Facebook. You pay for Facebook by letting them take all your data and give it and sell it to people. Yeah. But it's all optional. Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't, you know. 
I mean, you know, Jason has speculated on this, you know, despite not being on Facebook. Facebook probably has a pretty good profile of who he is just by, you know, kind of working out his, you know, sort of the people he associates with. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I, hmm. I mean, you, you have a valid point there. Um, but I'm not sure if it does really much. I mean, to be clear, just from a legal standpoint, I don't see, I see this as a non starter. Um, but problem is what does Facebook happen to have a monopoly on? It's, I mean, Twitter. I mean, what, what they have, from my perspective, what they have a monopoly on, and I still hold that this is one of the only reasons I'm on Facebook is they have a monopoly on my friends that use social media. I mean, aside from a select few people who absolutely refuse to use Facebook, uh, I believe you're one of them. Do you even have a Facebook account? I think oh, you do, but you never use it or something. I actually used to. Well, I hopped on back um, when I was in college, back when it was actually restricted to college students, um, right. from the early adopters. And I just got out of the habit. Um, I can't really claim it's a principal thing. I just don't do it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, know, I know some people that aren't on Facebook, but the vast majority of the people that I associate with are on Facebook whether they're mm-hmm. friends from the jeeping community or friends from work or friends from the IT industry. Um, I would say a good, I don't know, just a ballpark off the top of my head, 80, 80 to 90% of the people I associate with are on Facebook. So it's a really convenient way to, to talk mm-hmm. to them and share things with them. Um, but I still don't feel like I have to be on Facebook, right? It's not, not like, it's not like to own a computer or to operate online, you are required to have a Facebook account, at least not yet. There are certain sites where you need a Facebook account to authenticate because that's I the authentication gathered, mechanism I, they've chosen. But I gather that this is different in um, some third world countries. That the Facebook is much more an integral part of the of the online experience. Okay. Um you know, kind of like the way in the 90s, you know, there were a lot of people for whom AOL was the internet and the distinction was kind of blurred. Yeah. Um, I gathered that similar thing is, has um, taken root in you know, some countries that aren't this one. But I can't find the article where I was reading about that. You know, I, I did hear about some initiative that Facebook was taking in order to do such a thing. I didn't hear any follow-up as to where that went. Yeah. They were they were basically going to provide uh, low or no cost internet access in countries that had none. Yeah, and the article that I think we talked about it on this show, in fact, mm-hmm. uh, the article was talking about how you know Facebook and the internet are going to become synonymous. So you could be right; that could be a thing that has occurred now. I mean, what I really see this is just a a realization that for the amount of it's kind of still a new problem that for the amount of data that Facebook has, there aren't nearly enough controls in place. Um, yeah. I, like how to manage it, how to store it safely. I mean, they've been very irresponsible. I've never been a huge fan of, of government control, but there are cases where things just won't self-regulate. Well, think about you know, hotels, like it's, right? It's, it's like, it's the reason murder has to be against the law. Because if the government were just to be like, you know, you shouldn't murder, whatever. But there was well, no, re- no repercussions, people would murder people. <laughs> not <laughs> I mean, many, but yes, yeah, some, some possibly would. I think um, there would be a rise in murder. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thinking it's like, you know, for, for, you know, the problem is that IT is still not, not really a mature industry. You know, when you have a mature industry like car manufacturing, I don't know, hotels, there's this kind of baseline level of regulation that's almost invisible to to the average person. It's mandating certain standards, certain safety standards. Right. We're not we're not there yet. Um so regulation that's going to feel intrusive, you know, in twenty years it's just gonna be part of the firmament. We're we're gonna forget it was ever not there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I do feel like Facebook has abused their privileges in some cases, in many cases, in fact. I mean, we talked about it just a month ago or so uh, with, what was it, what was the name of that place? That firm. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. Analytica, yeah. 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 I mean, that was like an obvious abuse of the data that Facebook has. Whether Facebook was guilty of the the issue or not, you know, whether it was their fault or not, uh, it's still data that they're supposed to be good stewards of. 
Yeah. And I mean, as a sysadmin, that strikes home with me because that's something that, I mean, I have fought to keep user data private for a long time. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's just, I think that's a core of what we do. And some people don't think so. I don't know. Some people just see user data as a way to make money. Well, it's helpful. Well, hey, man, you work for a nonprofit. <laughs> yep. You know, Good which, point. You know, helps. We don't really have an incentive one direction or the other there. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Facebook is a monopoly, we think, or they think. Demand Progress was one of the people in that list, hmm. which, um, I don't know, it lends some credence to it or some mm -hmm. we're looking for credibility to it. Ah, Scientific American. I don't think we've featured Scientific American on this show before. They've done something really cool, I think, anyway. And since we sometimes cover science on this podcast instead of just technology specifically, uh, I thought this, this, this made the cut. Uh, they have found a way to transfer memories between snails by injecting RNA, which, hold on, I wrote down what that means, ribonucleic acid. From one snail to another. And, um, all right, I hate to do this, but I have to walk away for a second. Apparently, my wife just came to the back door and can't get in. <laughs> Sorry, folks, you'll, you'll get to see the, the sausage made live. Hang on. Well, this is where I'm supposed to stay, say something clever in his absence, but I'm kind of drawing a blank. For all those curious, um, I do not drink alcohol, but I have a very nice ginger beer here. This is uh, Gosling's ginger beer, which I think is uh, produced somewhere in Massachusetts. I have returned. <laughs> I told the audience I was drinking ginger beer. Good Sorry about that, folks. I will totally fix that in post. <laughs> ah, family, it's fun. Apparently, they were locked out because they came to the wrong door. Oh. All doors right, so hard. we... The doors are hard. So we will pick up with the science article. Okay. So, Scientific American reports that they have transferred memories from one snail to another by transferring ribonucleic acid, right? Is that what their thing was? Ribonucleic yeah. acid. Yes. Um, RNA, in other words. So apparently RNA is used by the body to transfer messages between muscles, which, I mean, I'll admit this is all new to me. I just read up on this before the show because I was curious. Um, but they were able to transfer RNA from one snail to another and then I guess they had one of these cases where they had done something to the snail they transferred from, which involved some sort of a shock. Yeah, okay? they shocked it. Yeah, they shocked the one snail, withdrew the RNA, put it in another snail, and then they saw evidence that the other snail that they had injected it into uh, had the memory of the shock, you know, because it knew that whatever gave it the shock was something it shouldn't touch. Um, now, obviously, I don't know how to judge how snails react to, th react to things, but this is why I'm not a scientist. But, I don't know, it's pretty cool. They say this is like groundbreaking changes the way people think of memory and everything. Well, I mean, if they're right. Um, yeah, I mean, the article spends some time, you know, going into just that, you know, this sounds cool and it could be a really big deal, but it, it really flies in the face of the... Um, I guess the conventional wisdom about how memory works. Yeah. Yeah. They, they talked about how, you know, 
obviously everyone thinks memory is stored in your brain and this sort of changes that thought. Maybe not necessarily that it's not stored in your brain, but it's stored differently than everybody had, had thought. So that's, I don't know. I mean, they 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 screwed around with this back in the '60s. I think the article actually mentions it, but I'd heard of it before with um, flatworms. So you get some flatworms, right, and you train them. Then you feed the flatworms to untrained flatworms, and see if the behavior carries over. And it nothing really ever came of it. Um, also sounds kind of weird and gross. But consuming the other flatworms, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see if the results can be replicated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, and, you know, and it's something other than snails. Yeah, right. That's the other thing. You, you need to be able to do this on more complex organisms. I mean, imagine if we could transfer memories between people. Like, this is the stuff of science fiction. Yeah, this is the Matrix. I need to know how to do a thing. Right. I need to know how to fly in, uh, to fly a helicopter. Oh, yeah. now I know how to fly a helicopter. That is interesting. Very interesting. Except they're not doing it through a spike to the back of my head. Oh, God, I hope not anyway. You know full well you'd sign up for that the minute it was offered. Uh, maybe. Hey, come on, man. <laughs> Internet direct to your brain? Maybe. You do it. Just, I, I guess it depends on how uncomfortable the spike is. That's important. Hmm. Moving it's on. Impo it's important the first time. <laughs> Speaking of uncomfortable, so ZDNet has an interesting article on. Uh, so, anyone who's got kids, I mean, I know, uh, Charles, I don't believe you have any children that I'm aware of. <laughs> uh, no, none that I'm aware of now. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, anyone who has kids knows that there is a fine line between raising your children, monitoring your children, like in a healthy way, and flat out spying on them. And everyone has their own opinion on what what level a parent should go to. In this case, uh, there is an app that you can get. Now I had it written down. Teen Safe is the name of the uh, the app. It's an app for Android or Apple, which apparently lets parents monitor their kids via their smartphone. They can see their text messages. They can see their location. I mean, like pretty much anything you'd expect a parent who wants to monitor every aspect of their child's life would want to know about their child's smartphone. Uh, so the, the company that runs it. Now I'm blanking on the name of the country. Or the, yeah, country. Company. Maybe it's not mentioned in the article. Doesn't. Maybe it's just teen safe. I guess it's just teen safe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they they it says here it says here bills themselves as a secure monitoring app for iOS and Android. Uh, apparently, they made some mistakes when they built out their cloud infrastructure. Is this um, another unprotected S3 bucket. I don't. They don't specify that it's an S3 bucket. They refer to it as a database. It sure so sounds I don't know, like. <laughs> I don't know if that's like data in an S3 bucket, or if it's like, what is it, RDS that AWS calls their, their database yeah. instances? Or if it's oh, like... Oh, no, this looks like it's, this kind of looks like it's a Mongo um, database. Huh. Celery. Celery is the name... Sorry, they have screenshots of a thing called Celery here, and I know of a service called Celery. It has to do with... Heck, it's part of Red Hat Satellite. What does it do in Satellite? Oh, whatever. I'm rabbit trailing here. Anyway, um, yeah. So they had data in AWS, and they didn't protect it properly, and people were able to get all of the data, including plain text passwords. Woo. Yeah. Nasty stuff, right? So, yeah, they uh, they claim that they fixed the problem. I don't know what that means for all the data that was leaked. I guess everyone has to change their passwords and they get free credit monitoring. <laughs> How much of that do we all have at this point anyway? Free credit monitoring? I think, yeah. I think depending on who you are and what security level you have in the U.S., uh, you probably could live the rest of your life with free credit, credit monitoring. <laughs> uh, terrible stuff. I mean, I hate to see this when it has to do with kids and kids privacy 
I mean, this that's 100% what this is. It's all kids that are being monitored by this teen safe application. And I would assume that with this data, someone could be snooping on your kids. And that oh, yeah. is just creepy stuff. Yeah, and it raises this question. And maybe the need for, well, definitely identifies the need for some kind of stronger data protection law. I mean, if you're storing a child's PII, there has to be actual consequences Yes. If you screw up, but that also means there has to be an articulable standard of how you can store that data. Yeah, not not just that; it has to be an achievable standard. Yeah. Like it has to be a standard that's written and built in such a way that your average small business, that you know, say TeenSafe is a ten employee company that's just just had a cool idea and they want to do this thing, right? It needs to be achievable, but they also need they also need to be responsible with that data, and there needs to be some way to ensure that they're being responsible. You know, it could be like something like PCI, you know, where there's kind of commodity ways to handle credit card transactions in a safe way. Yeah, you know, I mean, but you know, people aren't having to roll their own now. Even PCI, I mean, you, you talk to security analysts, you mention the word PCI and they have yeah. a seizure because right. it's just, it's, I get the point of PCI. I get why they're doing PCI, but it's, it seems like even that has gone off the rails and it's gone sideways. And it's, it's, I don't know, it just makes the whole thing difficult. Right. But I mean, it was meant, I think, in part to get away from, there was a company I used to work for. Um, no, actually, I'm not, let's just say there was a company I knew of that um, stored credit card transactions in a hair raising manner. Hmm. It is. That's good. Every, it is every bad story you have ever heard. I probably worked for the same company under a different name and different leadership and mm. different area. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you just raise like raise the baseline level of quality, you're doing something right. Yeah, and I mean that's obviously something that has to happen. I don't know. It's but yeah, you don't want to wind up with something like, you know, the GDPR which you know is incredibly invasive. Um, and very far reaching and which can require, I mean, not that a total rethink of how your company handles PII isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's incredibly expensive. And yeah, yeah for a small it, company, very difficult to actually achieve. When it require when it requires that you have to hire staff just to meet the regulation, mm -hmm. that seems like it's too high of a bar to me. Right. So, I mean, say I just had a cool idea and I want to I want to start a business. I mean, I I have a small business running at the moment, which is mm -hmm. going almost nowhere. And uh, if if I were to try to apply if I were if I were to be required to hire in an expert on any regulation, whether it's PCI, GDPR, whatever, it would sink the business. The business just isn't that profitable. Right. I mean, th think about the guy. Think about the people who are doing something cool as a side project or a hobby that's not making them any money yet. Like, how do you how do you fit that edge case? They they have literally no budget to handle this kind of thing. Counter argument counter argument can be made that um, that's the exact kind of project that shouldn't be handling personal data. But then, where does it start? Like, what if your side project requires that you handle? you know, private data, you have to suddenly, you have to become, I mean, yeah, you got to be responsible with it, but how do you get there? How do you get from, I have a cool idea that requires this level of stuff, this level of access to, I can responsibly manage the data that idea requires. Right. I mean, it's how, the where's the middle? The, yeah. I mean, the inevitable <laughs> result of capital. <laughs> right. I mean, the, the inevitable result of data protection loss is that the cost of doing business, the baseline cost of doing business is going to go up. Yeah. Um, in the same way that not any random person can start a car company and put a car on the streets. Yeah, I guess that's... And, there, and there's a reason for that. That's a very viable comparison. The big three didn't like competition. Also safety. Also safety. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess these are bigger problems than Iron System can solve. But yeah. at the very... At the, at no, the, we have, at the, we have very, the best solution. Sorry, what's that? Now we have the best solutions. We'll fix best everything. Solutions. We'll fix everything.
So bottom line, if you uh, if you use TeenSafe to spy on your child, you may want to change your passwords, like all of them. And I don't know, wash your eyeballs. <laughs> I hope they didn't get access to cameras on these devices. Oh, that would be so horrible. Boy, yeah. Uh, remember that article? I think it was before we had the show going. There was like an administrator at some high school where they had yeah. devices. And like you, you, part of the security program for the device was that you could see the camera, like in case it were stolen. That was local, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Was I'll it? look for it. I can't remember now. It was several years ago at this point. We've probably referenced it on the show before. I don't think we covered the article. I don't think the show was around yet. Well, there's one here from 2010, and yeah, it was Philly. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. So moving on to Tech Republic, which, by the way, will autoplay a video. Just fair warning. That bothers me. I don't know if it bothers you as a web developer. Do you hate autoplaying media as much as I do? I do, but my sound is also permanently off. <laughs> is that like the equivalent of tearing the speaker out of the computer because you hate the beep? I got headphones. If I want to listen to sound, I'll put them on. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, it auto plays and I hate that. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a news article and I guess I get the point. They're trying to play news like it's a TV show. But auto play on as though this was optional. Off. Hey, there we go. I've turned it off. All right. I figured it out. So, there's an interesting exploit in the DHCP client on Linux like everywhere. This particular article is referring to the DHCP client included in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I don't know that it's that specific. Maybe it is. It does seem the to be. That, the fact that Tech Republic calls out Red Hat Enterprise Linux specifically makes me feel like it's a Red Hat or RHEL If thing. it's logged in Red Hat Bugzilla, looks like a Red RHEL bug. Yep, indeed. I love how they keep including this this in like this is relevant for anything. Who noted that the proof of exploit code is small enough to fit in a tweet? One hundred forty like, okay. or two hundred and eighty. I know which side's tweet. When was this article written? <laughs> Recently? Is it two eighty or one? I don't know. Anyway, there is a remote code vulnerability in the DHCP client. Apparently, a compromised or I guess modified DHCP server could send a crafted response back to the DHCP client when it requests an IP address, which could trigger a local code execution. I guess you'd call that remote code execution, but whatever. It executes the code locally that's given back to it in the DHCP response. And of course, the DHCP client runs as... Root. Root. Uh, fail. <laughs> I mean, what else would it run as, right? Yeah, but... Oh. But yeah, so this is nasty, nasty stuff. So you know, Rel Five's not affected. Oh, good. Maybe, maybe we should have kept those boxes around. I guess. I guess we should have just stayed on Rel Five until Rel like nine was out or eight when Rel Five was finally decommissioned. Wait, is Rel Five decommissioned now? It might be. It is. Rel Five is out of support now. Oh yeah. Two revisions. That's what they support. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, um, basically what this requires to exploit is you have to have a DHCPD system or service running on the same network as the machine that's requesting uh, the DHCP address. Excuse me. So um, it would require an attacker to have a foothold on your network or control of your DHCP server, which are both bad things. But you could imagine like uh, a machine on your client's network, whether you're a business or a hotel or a college like we are, um, you know, I could run a DHCP server, say, in a lab somewhere, and clients that come online would be requesting addresses from me, and if they were rel, they could theoretically be uh, attacked by this. Um, but I would say that a properly segregated network, your servers are probably safe just because that's the way DHCP works. It has to get broadcast in order to get a DHCP, DHCP response. So anyway, there is... I don't know if it says here if there's a patch available yet. This is from like a week ago, so I think there probably is. Let me look at the CVE and see if there's a patch. 
probably going to make me log in to see if there's a patch. You know, I'm not sure it did. Let's see. Yet another thing I should have looked up before the show. Come on. Impact critical. Where's the uh, resolve? Let's see what's in resolve here. Yes, there are patches for DH client for RHEL 7 and RHEL 6. And Rev 4. Awesome. Yay. So yes, there is a patch. Um, I can include a link to the vulnerability article from Red Hat in the show notes. Let me copy this right now. There we go. So yeah, that's that. Patch your DHCPs, guys. Your DHCP clients. All your rail boxes. Uh, the article does mention Fedora as well, though I don't know if it, it elaborates on what versions of Fedora because Fedora is pretty far ahead of rail at this point. Because it's been several years since they branched off to build rail 7. All right, last article of the night. China's putting robots on the moon. You read this one, Charles. You want to elaborate? Yeah. I, I glanced over it. And that's about as much as I got. China's putting robots on the moon. Yeah, China's putting a um, going to have a going to put a rover on the moon, um, which you know has been done, but uh, the soft landing will take place on the dark side of the moon, and that has not been done. That is, you know, the far side. Um, you know. Plenty of things have orbited the moon and photographed the far side, but this will be the first soft landing on it. And to do the communication, they'll have a spacecraft to relay communication, which will be at the, um, I think, the L2 liberation point between the Earth and the moon. So it'll be at a place where it can at least, you know, orbit into position where it can talk to Earth and talk to the rover. Oh, interesting. So, I, mean, I mean, I went through a space phase. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, it's yeah. nice to see um, something new being done. It's nice to see other countries participating and sort of moving the ball forward. It's at least as cool as transferring memories between snails. Now, if they could take put send the snails to the moon, we yes. might really be on to something. Yes. Memory transferring moon lunar snails. That'd be awesome. So, yeah, China's getting back into the space race. They're sending robots to the moon instead of the Mars. We sent one to Mars. We're better. <laughs> or so NASA tells us. I saw pictures, man. That means it's real, right? Absolutely. Totally real. All right. Well, I think that closes up the news, unless you have more to talk about the new, the moon. I think I could probably see it outside. Nope. No, no nice. not quite. No. It's not, not quite dark enough yet. So, all right, let's move on. Run out of ginger beer here. Mm. Do you care to elaborate why your mug has a number on the bottom of it and mine doesn't? <laughs> no, I mean, because oh, cause Porter's hung it up, I guess. Um <laughs> and I'm like, yep, that's fine. I'm taking it home. Charles is the first co-host or guest to ever also come with a pewter mug to the podcast. That means you you win some sort of honor. I don't know what that is yet. <laughs> well, surely it was honor enough to appear on the show. Indeed. Or, you know. Absolutely. So I don't know if we have much in the way of announcements. Except that the DEF CON 610 group is meeting next week, is it? Let me look at the calendar. My calendar is such a mess at this point. I'm running out It'll... of aforementioned ginger beer. I'll be right back. Alrighty then. June 6th. I'll put that in the show notes, folks.
This is the part of the show where we get to see how far the range on Charles's wireless headset is. Well, I heard you the whole time. <laughs> Now I'm going to have to try ginger beer because you seem to be enjoying it so much. It packs a bit of a wallop, about 200 calories and 48 grams of sugar. Yeah, well, That's tasty. <laughs> I've drank worse in my life. <coughs> so, yeah, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, yeah, I can't think of anything else cool going on. Yep, I'm coming up empty. So you got anything interesting going on, Charles? Um, Other than being on Iron Sysadmin. I mean, that's that's exciting. I'll just do, right? do a little plug. Um, in about a month from now, um, our employer, uh, Lafayette College, is hosting a conference, the Academic Technology Administrators Conference, or ATAC. And so we're pulling together people who... Less on the pedagogical, more on just the straight staff administrative side of running learning applications at colleges, like learning management systems, um, content management systems, and also talking about kind of policy process, you know, focusing on that kind of stuff. Hmm. We'll have people attending from various colleges around the country. This is the first I've heard of this, Charles. <laughs> I wasn't in charge of promoting it. Um, but I guess not. So um, I'll be speaking with a colleague about how we do um, course archiving and retention. So we're managing those digital archives, ensuring that faculty have access to what they need, but we can maintain things for a certain amount of time, but do so sustainably. Like we can't keep everything until the end of time because he'll eventually tell me I can't have more disk space. So I would never do that. You've done it. You did it just, two days ago. I just keep finding cheaper ways to give you disk space. I don't know. Can you uh, get a link or something together for that? We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Otherwise, I've just been looking at ways to put things into the cloud. I've been trying to uh, get... I've been running servers in my basement for far too long. And I feel like running servers in the cloud is the new running servers in my basement. So that'll be uh, that'll be my next... My next project... Um, I don't know, Charles. You run you run any services in the cloud? Not really. Had a project or two that needed a thing, needed a place to live that wasn't necessarily work related. Yeah, I mean, I had some stuff running in AWS for a little while, but at this point, the only thing I have there anymore um, is Glacier. You know, which is yeah. not AWS. Just um, you know, I'm backing up my home NAS that way. Yeah, just I'm, run, I'm running. Stuff. I'm running next cloud, but you know, I'm running next cloud here. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. I, I also, though. I also run next cloud um, for a lot of personal things. But I've honestly, I've been, I've been using Google Drive so much more for that same use case that I'm starting to debate whether I keep next cloud around or not. I don't know that there's anything I run, I have in next cloud that I couldn't put on Google Drive without being paranoid. It's not like I'm storing secrets. It's just like pictures and documents and stuff like that. What I like about what I like about Nextcloud as opposed to Google Drive. Well, I guess with Google Drive the files are there locally, but I feel like I have more of a guarantee with Nextcloud that the files are actually there locally and I have a predictable yeah. and I have a predictable um, directory structure. It's like I have a fairly large digital archive of documents that I keep indexed in Zotero. But I do the indexing in Zotero, you know, sort of citation metadata. But the actual raw files are in Nextcloud, and I can set up stable links from Zotero to Nextcloud. And I feel like Google Drive can't quite do that for me. Yeah, I, I mean, guess my data is a little less structured than that. It's more or less like I need a place where I put documents, and inside of those documents, inside of that folder, I need subfolders for like categories of documents. I don't have any like external index for doing any of that because I just don't have that much data, you know? Yeah, like my, I have like how many, let's see.
Well, I mean, I, like I've got like thousands of things indexed in Zotero. I couldn't do it in Google Drive. It just wouldn't scale. Yeah, right, right. But and, I use and, it for actually composing, obviously, because you know, for shared composition, it's fantastic. Nothing's really come close. Oh, you mean Google? You use Google, you use Google Drive for that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, next cloud with uh, Calibora Office comes close, mm-hmm. but I found it to be not quite as clean. And yeah. I mean, you could probably expect that, I suppose, right? It was yeah, kind of laggy. It. We we used it we used it for the show notes for Iron Sysadmin for a while, and it worked. But I don't know. It was just just buggy enough that I never quite got comfortable with it. You know what I mean? You know, you know yeah. how when a piece of software is like just glitchy enough that you don't quite trust it. Yep. That's where I was with that, and maybe maybe it's improved. Maybe it will improve in the future. Maybe it's already fixed some of those bugs. Um, but you know, I don't know. It's if I put something on Google Drive and I want to do collaborative editing, I can always trust that it's just going to work. I know you hear that from all of the like perceptibly lazy admins, like I just want it to work, but not put any work into it. I probably sound like one of them now. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> No, but honest to God, with Google Drive, it's true. It's stable. It can be used by lots of people, and the the barrier to entry is low. For what it does, it's yeah. very, very good. That being said, its folder structure, even with Team Drives, leaves a lot a lot to be desired. Uh, I mean, Team Team Drives improved it a lot. If you're talking yeah. about like a, a from a structure level, yeah, but. Yeah, I don't know if I, I. I guess I haven't used it as much that I've that I've found the shortcomings there. Before I, Team Drives, we were starting to have within our groups real problems with finding yeah. things, with sharing things. Absolutely. It's like, okay, here's a document. I'm editing it. I've conceptually, I just don't know where it is. And you know, I mean, at some level, that doesn't matter. But it, yeah, it's I mean, that's you never need to share things with somebody. You end up. You end up having to use the search to find the document that you already have open. Because looking yeah. at the document, it doesn't even show you what freaking folder it's in. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. I almost feel defeated by doing it. But you know what? It's It, it seems to be the right choice. It, it works. Um, I've also started putting my photos on Google Photos which has been sort of creepy because it's been generating like all of these collages and photo albums from my pictures for me because it's like, Oh, you took all these pictures the same day and yeah. it must be an event. <laughs> it's kind of creepy. It also identified my dog's face. That's scary. It is kind of scary. And it even told me about it. It's like, Hey, we found this thing. We think it's a pet. It's in your pictures. And you know, luckily it didn't come up with like a picture of my mother-in-law or something. It was actually a picture of a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I clicked on it and it showed me all the pictures that contained the dog. I'm like, oh my gosh. This is this is creepy. Just creepy. And and it's not even just like direct photos, like head on. You know how it's easy to identify a face head on, especially a dog. Well, this is like the dog from a side profile, like the rear three quarters of her face. Like, wow, you guys are good at this. <laughs> The whole thing is creepy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, cloud services. Um, as far as servers, I guess this is where I was going when I started this. Uh, I actually found that DigitalOcean has like a ridiculously good deal on cloud. They call them droplets, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like five bucks a month for a decently specced, like one CPU, one gig of memory machine. Which doesn't sound bad. like it doesn't sound like much, but I mean that's enough to run a site, a website on. Oh, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I need. I need a couple places. I need a place to run a couple of websites. And then I, I, won't like need, I wouldn't need my personal server anymore. I like Dita. I like DigitalOcean. They maintain good documentation. I've used it before, just my own work projects, personal projects. I mean, I've never hosted anything with them, but I've heard good things. And no, that's not a bad deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the pricing's there. They also do... Um, I think it's a container service that they'll run a service for you instead of a server. Like you can say, Hey, run WordPress for me. And they'll give you a WordPress, which I feel like is probably a container or maybe it's a server running WordPress. I don't know, but, um, WordPress runs just fine in a container. 
Yeah, yeah, right, right. So yeah, that's what I got going on. I guess we can uh, move along unless you have anything more to chat about. Nobody wants to hear about my model trains. Let's move on. Okay, let's let's move on. <laughs> I do love a good scale train display. I mean, maybe that's just me. I don't know how many sysadmins in the world like train displays, but if you like train displays, let us know. We'll do a show on trains. <laughs> Absolutely. We probably could between the two of us. I'm a little, well, I think so. I'm a little rusty on model trains. It's been a while since I've set up ours, but uh, like my entire childhood was model trains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we've got Charles here because uh, for a long time we've talked about uh, how I was going to have a coworker of mine on to talk about WordPress. Um, I have long said that I feel like, like most applications, WordPress can be run badly or it can be run well. And uh, being run badly will get you a compromised WordPress system. And that, I think is why WordPress has such a bad rap. And maybe that's because in the history, they did, in the past, they didn't do a great job of security updates. I really don't know. I've only been following WordPress for the past, I don't know, year or so when I started thinking about running it for my own stuff. Um, I know it. it's always had a bad reputation as long as I can remember back. But we run a lot of it, and we haven't had that many issues. I'm, I'm almost afraid to say that. But um, I think Charles is a big part of that, and I thought maybe it'd be a fun thing to talk about. Um, if any of you are interested in running WordPress, maybe we can elaborate a little bit on how to run WordPress well instead of just run, run WordPress adequately. So, uh, Charles, you got a couple of uh, links in the show notes here. You've got, I assume, a couple of talking points. I guess we'll just dive yeah. right in. Huh? Well, thanks for the introduction, Nate. And let me start by saying that it's pronounced Saugatuck Brewing Company. <laughs> You've been waiting for that, haven't you? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. When I went back to Michigan, I drove right past the place, but they weren't open yet, or I would have gotten you a shirt or something, you know, so see, that you could always remember it. See, my, my first inclination was to pronounce it as Saugatuck, because that's exactly how it's spelled. But yep. usually that gets me into a scenario where it's like, you uncouth bastard you just pronounced it wrong it's sogata <laughs> yeah no it's a weird <laughs> case where it is it's pronounced pretty it's much how it looks it's actually pronounced like it's spelled that's awesome yeah. so anyway <laughs> my pronunciations of breweries in michigan aside <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is kind of a big topic and i am not an expert on wordpress and security i consider myself an expert on deploying WordPress, which isn't quite the same thing, but they kind of go together. So I'll try to attack this a couple different ways. I mean, the first thing I think to keep in mind is when you're talking about WordPress, you're talking about a product that is running, I think the current estimate is what, 29% of the web. Right. That's, that's massive. And that's encompassing a lot of different types of operations. You know, you've got major newspapers that are using WordPress for front end or back end or sometimes both. You've got places like Lafayette where we're running, you know, multiple WordPress multi-sites. We're serving up our main page, departmental pages, faculty blogs, e-portfolios. You know, it's it's a lot of stuff. It's most of the public facing web presence. Then you've got you know, people like Nate just running kind of a hobbyist site or two. You've got people who are running WordPress to sell stuff who are, you know, probably potential Wix or Squarespace customers who have just like a site or two sites that maybe they run themselves. Maybe that there's some small agency that built it for them and keeps it up to date for a fee. Point is, you've got this really broad range of experiences and approaches to administration. Um and not all WordPress installations are created equal. So I guess I can start by describing what our environment looks like and then sort of go into how that, how in many ways our environment is not normal. And it kind of gets into why other environments are maybe a little more prone to compromise. I mean, for starters, we took the time to actually figure out how to keep SE Linux on instead of just turning it off from the get-go. We did. 
Um, we're running on RHEL 7 servers. Um, they are hardened of Hesse Linux. Um, and so one of the most interesting things about our WordPress environment is that uh, so we're using Apache as our web server. Apache can't write to its own document root, um, which... That's weird. Which eliminates one of the biggest sources of compromises in the WordPress environment, which is something nasty getting in and modifying core WordPress files. That's something that, I mean, that's something that can't happen without some broader compromise in the system. Apache doesn't have the right permissions, and even if it did, um, SE Linux would prevent it from writing there. Um, I mean, we don't allow code execution, PHP code execution outside of the document root. So you, know, you couldn't like download some PHP and then execute it. These are things that just can't happen at the environmental level. Moving, um, moving away from the strict server architecture, um, we use WordPress multi-site. Uh, WordPress multi-site is, is a core feature of WordPress. So in a default stock WordPress installation, it's a single site. You have a site, it has posts and pages and users, and there are user permission levels, but the administrator on a single WordPress site can do anything, um, you know, including, you know, very unsafe things like injecting JavaScript or iframes into a post. Yeah. So we use multi-site. Multi-site is what it sounds like. It's a single, it's still a single code base and a single database, but many, many tables because there's sort of a containing overarching site and then a bunch of subsites, which each can have their own users and permissions. What's cool about that is that you can really lock down the permissions on those subsites. So for example, let's say you know, for our departmental multi-site, you know, we have 150 subsites, one for each academic department or program. And there will be people from those academic departments and programs who are administrators and can do lots of things. But one thing they can't do is insert JavaScript because that's something that you're just not allowed to do unless you're an actual network privileged user. This saved us in a small way, but saved us or a couple of years ago, an administrative assistance computer got compromised by some kind of phishing spread worm. Um, and it actually tried to inject a payload when that the computer hadn't been cleaned yet and the assistant went to go modify the department's WordPress site and it tried to inject the payload into the site. WordPress stripped out the JavaScript. All that got in was a bunch of kind of ugly looking markup, you know, for like spam porn, whatnot. I mean, it looked bad. But it didn't have an active component. It couldn't damage anything. It just kind of looked awful. Um, and that's a case where that principle of least privilege definitely saved us. Um, like I said, this is unusual. Um, you know, I describe this, you know, I go to the local WordPress meetup and I describe this and I get blank stares because just the whole way we've approached it is not what if you're just running one or two WordPress sites, you don't really know a lot. I mean, you know, we're talking about an environment where people are still adding plugins to a site sometimes, like uploading them with FTP. Right. And not and not even SFTP, you know, just FTP. Right. Where you know you have people who are trying to modify the behavior of their site and you know, they're being told to take, put random snippets of PHP, you know, put them into a functions.php file. You know, they don't even know what the code does. I found it on um, the internet. It must be safe. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. That's just the reality for the people in this position. But that's an environment where you're much more at risk of, you know, installing something you shouldn't have or you just, you don't even know how to lock your site down. Yeah, so I mean, as a as an not to interrupt you, Charles, but as no, an no, example no. of that, I I can recall when just a few months ago when I set up my first uh, WordPress site, which is a site I was going to be transferring. In fact, I think it may have been ironsysadmin.com when I moved the when I separated my personal site from uh, the podcast's site. Um, 
there's a there's a feature in the WordPress admin where you can say, I'd like to install a plugin and just sort of point to where the plugin is or upload a tar gzip and it'll just install the plugin for you. And it wasn't working. And as I'm trying to figure out why it's not working, I, of course, asked Charles and I'm like, look, does WordPress need write access to the web route in order to make this happen? And your answer was yes. And I think I came back with, we don't do that, right? And I <laughs> and came back with, no. <laughs> no. And I said, good, I'm not going to either. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, you know, from a security posture, it's great. But it does mean we had to evolve this whole method of deploying WordPress right. that is external to the web server. Um, I can drop in the show notes if you like. Um, you know, this talk I gave at WP Campus last year about how we're using Capistrano and Composer to, you know, kind of put the package together and actually deploy it on the web servers in a secure and reliable way. And that that's just, that's insane for um, people who are on managed hosting and kind of doing their own thing. The good well, yeah, news... I, mean, I, I could imagine having worked at a web host and having done web hosting, I could imagine how easy it would be for me to just say, yes, you're a customer... <laughs> Um, you need to be able to manage your WordPress site. I'm going to make this work for you so that you don't have to bother me when you want to install a plugin. Yeah. But it's also a tremendous security risk. And, you know, it goes worse than that. I mean, there are, it's possible um, in an out of the box WordPress installation, or maybe you need a plugin for this, but I don't think so, to actually modify plugin code, you know, from the interface. But, you know, but if you're, um, but if you're in an environment where you don't you don't have shell and your only way of interacting with the web server is via FTP. Right. You know, it, what choice it, do you have? Exactly. What choice do you have? Um, one of the linked articles in there specifically recommends turning that off, you know, as a security measure. You know, that's like, well, yeah, duh, obviously. But, you know, if you're just getting into this, you know, it might not occur to you why that's so dangerous. Oh, yeah. I mean, to be honest, um, it may seem naive for an experienced sysadmin, but I looked at the thing and I'm like, oh, this would be awesome if this worked. And then when I started thinking about, well, what this needs and what this means in order to make this work, I'm like, well, that might be convenient, but I'm just going to have to live without it because this is not a good way to run a website. Yeah. A website with right access to its own web root or even a portion of its own web root or even just anything that's executable is just... That's been a big no-no forever. Yep. So let's take a step back and talk about why WordPress can be exploited and what WordPress core has done to try to mitigate that a little bit. So WordPress is a content management system. It's built in PHP. And the way, the way you get things to appear on WordPress, you know, you have your post content, right? But let's say you want to kind of sort of add a widget or add some stuff that displays. The way a WordPress plugin typically works is by filtering the output. So output sort of passing up the chains, going through things, and as it's being passed from one plugin to another, you can filter it, you can add things. Um, it's wonderfully flexible. And Drupal is similar. Um, so instead of having to hack core in order to accomplish a particular task, you know, you just you hook into a filter and do something arbitrary with the output. Right. That also means that your content is more often than not built on on a sort of a this pile of regexes, um, which you know we are it can go very badly. Um, and if you're relying on third-party plugins, you're trusting that those plugins um, are doing what they claim to do, and that they're not malicious. And that they're not, um, they haven't been implemented badly. There was a case not long ago. I'll try to keep this brief because I know you're on mm -hmm. a roll. There was a case not long ago where a uh, an author of a WordPress plugin had decided had had very painstakingly uh, curated their plugin. Has took great pride in in whatever their plugin was doing. I, I can't remember the specifics as to who this was or or what their plugin was for. And then one day they got an offer for uh, a company to purchase their plugin. The company wanted to do whatever it is they wanted to do with it. They made an offer to the, the, per, the author and, and they took it. And this plugin that people had trusted for years because it was you know authored by this person they trusted mm -hmm. and person who'd been doing well by the community for all these years, all of a sudden had 
um, what was it? Some sort of ad tracking yep. JavaScript added to the plugin. Mm -hmm. And now all these sites that had the plugin installed that were doing the right thing, updating their plugins on a routine basis, all of a sudden got ad tracking software added into their, mm -hmm. their websites or whatever it was. It was some sort of quasi malicious code that was added into the, the plugin. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had at least one plugin at Lafayette where it wasn't quite that, but the plugin changed hands and then changed dramatically and without much warning. Right. Um, we guard against that by having a code review process. We caught it. We saw that it had changed and um, <laughs> we have this plugin that's been stuck in an outdated version for going on four years. It's not very important. Because the change of the the plugin wasn't, it didn't meet our standards. It was a breaking change that we were not prepared to deal with. And right. over time, we determined it did not need to be dealt with. The plugin continues to work and doesn't have any security issues. It just doesn't have whatever updated features have come out since then. Nope. I assume it's uh, the right side. Yeah, but again, it's a case where it's fairly, it was fairly limited in the first place, what it was doing. And it continues to do what it needs to do well. And at this point, it's deprecated, and it's only installed on a multi-site that's being retired soon anyway. But otherwise, we might have had to fork just right. to, you know, to code around the issue. Right. Um, but yeah, you're, it's a huge problem, and it goes down to, you know, leads, leads in very nicely to the problem with plugins. Ultimately, you are going to be relying on reputation. You know, it's not like with packages from, say, Red Hat, where you know it kind of has Red Hats and Premature that this is a good package, it's safe. I mean, you still should test, but it's not going to break your stuff. Right. Um, There's been some preliminary testing, and yeah. it's from a corporate entity which you're already paying money to, which yeah. should mean you can trust them to do what you're paying them to do at the very least. Yeah. Here, I mean, you know, there are some good people doing theme and plugin review for WordPress.org, which, you know, is the free WordPress plugins repository. And they'll ensure that whatever is uploaded there complies with certain guidelines. But, you know, they can't do everything. They can't guard against everything. And realistically, that's really only checking something that when it makes it into the repository for the first time. Now, if you report something malicious being done later, they will act and they'll deal with it. But that's you know, it's a cold comfort if your site was serving up ads to uh, yeah, exactly. to the internet. Like, oh, we totally fixed that. It's only been up there for a month or whatever. So yeah, I mean, the, we've wrestled with this internally. It's like how to how to figure out what's safe and what's not. Um, Part of that is we've been working with other schools to try to develop sort of a blessed list of themes and plugins, you know, that we that we trust, that we find useful, whose authors we trust. I mean, it's all reputational. Um, so, but if you're a Nate, you are totally frozen up there. I'm just not moving. Oh, okay. All right. Holy so, very uh, still. All right. But yeah, <laughs> I'm listening you know, intently. But if you're an individual site operator, I like to call them owner operators. You know, you yeah, you, you kind of have to be plugged into the commu WordPress community a little bit to have a good sense of what's a good plugin and what's not. Fortunately, there's a lot of local meetup groups where you can get that kind of advice. But it's not quite the same thing as having a paid um, provider. Right. Now, going to the question of core WordPress and whether it's safe or not, um, I've been dealing with WordPress at Lafayette for like five and a half years now. I can recall maybe one time in the last five and a half years where we had a vulnerability that seemed serious enough that we kind of dropped what we were doing and worked on getting it out. Um and even then, it wasn't anything on the scale of either of the Drupal Geddens. Well, how many of them there are? I don't want to reopen that discussion because that'll kill the podcast. There's three. But, you know, okay, but you know that kind of, <laughs> like that kind of all hands on deck. You know, something's wrong in the very internals of the product. 
I haven't seen that in WordPress in the time I've been dealing with it. I mean, I'm not here to, you know, shit on Drupal or anything like that. Um, just saying I haven't seen that. The big, you know, there's been a couple big waves of WordPress compromises, and it was because of plugins that had, you know, widely used popular plugin, usually something that had some kind of upload facility. So it's already got that kind of interaction with the file system and just something wasn't something wasn't safe or shipping a third party library that was out of date. I remember there was one like that where there was some popular thumbnail library and it was just like Tim Thumb or something. And it was shipping a very old version. But core WordPress has been alive to the, sort of the their responsibility for serving up that much of the internet. So a couple of years ago, and this is a big push. I remember when it started, um, they started doing automatic updates mm -hmm. uh, for minor versions. So WordPress is on a regular release cycle now for minor releases. I think it's every, well, for major releases, I think it's every, well, the major releases are like, what, every six months. The minor releases are, you know, just in between that as time permits. But, you know, for people out there where Apache can write to the web route, um, They'll do they'll do an automatic update for the minor releases, and you know WordPress just in the background will download the new core code and update itself. Right, which is good if you've got that right privilege. Now, um, there is an option for those of us that don't have that enabled, though, right? Well, um, well, what do you mean? So. Uh, in my case, I do not allow Apache to write to the web root, but instead mm -hmm. I use, what is it called, WPCLI? Yeah, so yeah, so there are options. You know, obviously if Apache can't write to the web, web root or WordPress just if it detects that it's in a version control environment, won't even try. We just, we actually have it disabled in WP config because we know it right. won't work and we don't want right. it to even think about trying to do it. Um. But you know, but yeah. So, but for the people out there who aren't advanced users, just this is a way of ensuring, you know, if there's a bug fix coming out, that you know, if there were a scary problem that could be fixed in a minor release, um, there's a pretty high level of confidence that people would be patched against it. Right. And I've seen the numbers. It's a very, very small percentage of sites that don't successfully auto update. It's actually pretty cool. You know, that they've been able to do that, that it works, yeah, I mean, that they got hosting providers on board with supporting it as, um, you know, as a thing. It is a great idea. Um, but again, it means you have to allow Apache to write to the web root, which isn't but necessarily a great idea. I know a lot of people that run WordPress do that because of the mm -hmm. convenience factor. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess if most of your user base is going to do that, having a system that requires that isn't such a bad thing yeah and i think um this is just it's pragmatic like you're not going to get people away from that model um so because it would mean they'd have to adopt a much more evolved deployment mechanism right. and people aren't going to do that people are going to drop wordpress and go do something else you know yeah, your average do. your average person running a blog wants it to be as easy as possible without requiring someone like me to support their site yeah um, but yeah, there are options. You know, you can you can do what we do. You know, some sort of deployment mechanism, or you know, there's WPCLI, which is the WordPress command line administration tool, has the ability to do an update. Um, I know people who use it; they swear by it, they love it. Not an option for us, but I yeah, hear it's pretty I, good. I use, it, use it for other things. I use it mainly because I wanted a way to, from the command line, update WordPress in the same way that I was doing on Drupal with Drush. Yeah, and that they get you that. Yeah, and with this, I've actually automated it. Um, I figure I'm more interested in having the security updates done than the uptime of my personal sites, right? So I would rather have a secure site that broke due to an automatic update that I then mm -hmm. have to react to than an insecure site that ha that is you know weeks out of date because yeah. I just haven't had the time to go update it. You know, for all that so, we do our we do our WordPress updates during the day. I mean, we do it like during a business day. Nobody's yeah. ever noticed. Yeah. Right. Um, 
So, folks, if, if you can compromise, if you can figure out which uh, WordPress plugins I run and compromise one of them, my site will automatically install them at some point, and then you can compromise my site. So good luck with that. <laughs> so, there's a pretty active community out there for supporting WordPress security plugins, and those do a bunch of different things. Um, and I do have a link to an article about them in the, um, in the show notes. Okay. Um, for WordPress security plugins compared. Um, and you know, again, a lot of this, this is an example of what you need when you're in this kind of environment where Apache might have right. So there are plugins that'll basically be doing checksums to see if the state of your WordPress system files are what you'd expect. Um, again, not something we need because they can't change. Right. We, we think they can't change. Um, you know, there are plugins that will, you know, WordPress by default is using local auth. It could be brute forced. So plugins that will actually detect brute force attacks and stop them. Similar to, say, OSIC in some respects. You know, you get enough failed attacks from uh, the same IP, it'll stop taking login requests from that IP. Uh, there was a product called Brute Protect that I think got rolled into Jetpack that did that, but also the IP database was shared. So it was centralized and shared to all client installs. So if there were bad actor IPs out there that were brute forcing um, WordPress sites, they would be banned everywhere. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. Crowd, crowdfund your block list. We were real close to installing it before it got... Um, rolled in the jetpack and then we said the hell with it because well it's complicated yeah. um you know, there are plugins out there that'll maybe um you know it'll block off access to xml rpc if that's not a thing that you're using i mean you could just disable it but or you know plugins that'll you know protect access to the wp to the restful endpoints if that's not a thing that you're using and you don't want them exposed um, maybe a plugin that would limit access to the WP admin. So maybe it's not available from outside a certain IP range. Apparently there's a lot of schools that do that and would actually be the functional equivalent for us, say, sticking, you know, WordPress login behind VPN. Right. It's not, it's not a terrible idea, but we have to fight people. There are plugins out there that'll do, um, you know, that'll give you local two-factor authentication by some implementation. Um, you know, there's some plugins out there that'll just log all actions. We're trialing one right now on one of our sites just to see what kind of data we get from it. Hmm. You know, an actual action log, you know, beyond a web log, but actually saying, you know, user user foo did did this action. Right. You know, that could be a problem. You know, if somebody, if a site got trashed, um, you don't know, you know, these you know, folks aren't going to have Splunk and they're going to need some forensic help to figure out, you know, what went wrong. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, letting the user do that sort of thing is sort of what WordPress is kind of about, right? You're talking about like site admins being able to see this data. So yeah, it's, I would say WordPress as a product out of the box by itself is probably pretty safe. Probably. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in the business of guarantees. Yeah, um, right. Well, no, I mean, you, you can't, you can't guarantee that anything is secure. In hmm. fact, I wouldn't even say that a WordPress site run by the most paranoid admin in the world is 100% secure because that scenario just doesn't exist no but you can do a lot to um reduce the threat surface and make yourself um at least a much smaller target um you know there are things you can do to maybe obscure your presence you know hide what version of wordpress you're running or somehow maybe try to disguise that it's wordpress at all but that's pretty hard to do um, yeah i think there's structure there's just certain factors or certain keys that would identify a WordPress site as a WordPress site. And, um, 
you know, once, I mean, even just working with WordPress more now than I have in the past, I've been able to just sort of pick up on things on sites that I'm visiting that make me feel like, hey, I wonder if this is WordPress. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in, in a lot of cases, they are, uh, which just goes back to that that number you threw around at the beginning of your your segment here about what twenty nine percent or roughly twenty nine percent of the it's internet somewhere is between now running 25 on and twenty nine percent. I mean, it's enormous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and when you consider the the enormity of the internet, that's a pretty big percentage. I can't say. I mean, I'd be curious to see if any other uh, CMS or blog platform or whatever has nearly that sort of a stake. None of the open source ones do. But I couldn't tell you what the other 71% is running. Right. Well, that's the thing about the internet, though. It could be literally anything. Yeah. It could be a fridge. <laughs> but yeah, WordPress certainly presents a very inviting target. It's because of the sheer number of people out there um, who have a common, sort of a common, you know, common platform. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not it's, as widespread as windows but it's kind of the same principle yeah it's the same the same concept behind why windows appears to be such an insecure operating system i mean you can argue all day long about how they've done better and how they were worse in the past and all that there's still a very big common platform that if i'm an attacker and i want something that's going to get me the most bang for my buck i'm going to write an exploit that runs on windows yeah and to get a foothold you only need one person to make a mistake right right yeah, so, you know, our WordPress security posture is about ensuring that that one person isn't really in a position, even if they do make a mistake, to actually trash their site. Right. And so that's with careful careful use of permissions, um, the fact that the fact that we vet plugins beforehand and we have the ability to reject a plugin. Um, so you know, there are people... You know, I've seen WordPress environments where, I mean, it's like the canonical picture of the um, person's, you know, they launch here in Explorer and like the whole top half is taken up with like toolbars and Bonsai Buddy and God only knows right. what else. Right. You know, they have all these different WordPress plugins installed, like two or three different plugins that are basically fulfilling the same function and their site's just a mess. But well, they I mean, it's really no any better than have advice. It's a really tempting thing, right? Because it is so easy to install a plugin on WordPress. It's like, oh, cool, I can have this plugin that does this funny little thing, like show me the weather or, you know, whatever. And before you know it, your WordPress site has a dozen plugins or more. And if you're not vetting what those plugins are actually doing in the background, hey, I mean, what? half the, half the people have plan. no idea how they would vet them. Right? That weather plugin is making a web service call. Right, Probably. exactly. How safe exactly. is that web service call? Right, right. So, so we've, yeah, um, we've rejected all kinds of plugins in the past because we went looking. You know, we couldn't review the whole code base, but we went looking for certain things to see what was up and what they were doing. And we're like, you know, I'm just not comfortable with this. Yeah, this just doesn't look good. We're not. We're not going to subject our servers to that. And I, I thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd prefer to not trash our environment. Prefer to not to wake you up. Um, yeah, that would just make headaches for both of us, and we don't need that. No, we don't need that. I mean, it. I will say, I mean, it does mean that at some level we are passing that cost on to the end user, because yeah, we can't give them we can't give them the WordPress environment that they want. Um necessarily because it has fewer bells and whistles than they would like, but we can give them a WordPress environment that is stable and secure. And naturally, as administrators, we're going to prioritize that. Yeah. Um, we, you know, it's hard to find that balance. Because we nobody probably, wants nobody wants a WordPress site that is serving porn when it's not supposed to be. No, but they might like, to, like us to take more of a risk. about that. <laughs> they might like us to take more of a risk, though. You know, oh, right, we, right. you know, could we, could we live on the edge a little more? Maybe, probably. Um, right. Well, it sounds like you've been through your bullet points here. If I'm keeping track here properly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose there are any, any questions that built up in chat. Uh, let me just check to be sure, but nobody was in there a minute ago. Yeah. No, doesn't look that way. Didn't get any viewership tonight. So, uh, 
Folks, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can watch us live on YouTube when we record. I know we're not always the most regular as far as what time we go live, but uh, if you subscribe and you hit the little notify, you'll get notified when we go live. And I try to get it up on Twitter and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, we, we like it when people join the chat and either heckle us or give us constructive criticism or just ask questions while we're while we're going. You can be an active part of the show. That's pretty cool. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Charles, for coming on the show. And uh, I think you brought up some very good points. Maybe they don't apply to everybody, but um, I think anyone who wants to run a better WordPress or a more secure WordPress should uh, should review the links that you've added. And I'm, like I said, they'll all be in the show notes when this show goes live. Well, thank you, Nate. It was certainly my pleasure to come on and try to shed a little light on what is a pretty complex um, subject that has a lot of answers, but figuring out what the right answers are for what you're doing for your environment, I think can be very difficult. I mean, this is a, this is a perennial topic at WordCamps, you know, how to secure your WordPress site, best practices, and especially targeted at people who aren't sysadmins, aren't developers, you know, they're, they're just they're just trying to run their site, which is you know selling a product or talking about what they do, or you know it's their their volunteer group, and you know they just they want to be out there telling people about what they're doing. They don't want to be spending their whole time running right. WordPress because that's not right. fun. Right, and I mean this almost sheds some light on one of the things that I see wrong with the way the cloud movement is going. Anybody can turn on a server. All you need is a credit card and an AWS account or a DigitalOcean account or a, a Rackspace account, and you can spin up a cloud instance. And maybe you have no idea what you're doing. And maybe you don't know that you've just spun up your, your what was the mobile app we were just talking about? Teen whatever? Teen, uh, teen something. I don't know. Teen owned, uh, teen, 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 <laughs> teen compromised, uh, team spied upon, teen, yeah. teen snoop. We'll call it teen snoop. <laughs> teen safe. Teen, teen safe. safe. Maybe you've just spun up your awesome million dollar business idea on servers that someone's going to walk into and steal all your data, and you have no idea. You know that's that's one of the problems that I see with cloud infrastructure, and uh, people seem to think that. Just because they are able to turn on a server, they don't need someone who knows how to run that server. They just need someone who knows how to put an application on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm not trying to sound like an old man telling you to get off my lawn, but um, if you're going to run cloud services, you still need to understand what's underneath them. And that goes for WordPress as well as it does for any other application. You need to, that or you need to pay a service provider that will do it for you. There's a there lot are, of sorry, there's, go a ahead. Lot, you know, there's a lot of managed WordPress hosting providers out there. Most of them are pretty good. Um, they'll do the automatic updates. Maybe they'll auto update other plugins for you. Make security plugins available. Ensure that the shared hosting you're on is reasonable, up to date, right. like updated versions of PHP, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to say don't. I'm not trying to say you should steer away from cloud providers because let's just face it, uh, that, that battle is lost. <laughs> if it were a battle to begin with. Um, what I'm saying is you need to understand what you're getting into and you need to know what levels of security and what levels of management you're responsible for and your, your cloud provider might be responsible for. I can tell you right now, if you're spinning up an EC2 instance and putting WordPress on it, you are responsible for everything from the hypervisor on up. I mean, yes, everything from that, from your instance on up is you. It's all on you. And you need you, to stop and take a breath and ask if this is the right thing that you are doing. Right, right. Whereas if you go to, say, I don't know, DigitalOcean and say, run me a WordPress, um, I, I haven't vetted DigitalOcean specifically, but if you're asking them to run you an application, there's probably an administrator that's figured out how to run the application for you. And all you need to worry about is the application. So, you know, there's levels to everything. So, uh, yeah, at any rate, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Um, I think we've gone on long enough about WordPress. Uh, unless you had any closing thoughts, I think you already got them out, huh? Oh, man, I could run at the mouth all night. But, yeah, I think, um, I think I put some stuff out there. And right. if folks have feedback, I'd be um, 
happy to say more, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to, uh, I guess the best way to contact us would be through, uh, I guess you could email the podcast at podcast.ironsystemin.com. Um, you could also comment on our YouTube video or I think I have comments disabled on my WordPress site. <laughs> so I don't know if you can do it there. But yeah, I think email is the best way to do it. Reach out or reach out to me on Twitter at Gangriff or uh, Charles, you want to share your Twitter, ha- Twitter handle? Sure. Um, I tweet from time to time. I can be found at at M-A-C-K-E-N-S-E-N. Um, I tweet about uh, WordPress, web development in general, Moodle, trains, football during football season. Yeah, you know, funny. It's, uh, it's a grab bag. And funny things you've overheard. Oh, oh yeah. Funny things I've <laughs> overheard. Usually this guy, but not always. Sometimes uh, me, sometimes one of our other coworkers. Yeah, yeah. Come <laughs> hit me come hit me up on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So uh speaking of the socials, you can find Iron Sysadmin on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh just give us a search, uh, because I don't have the URLs handy. <laughs> I'm not going to look for them. Uh, Facebook is a garbled mess anyway. So uh, You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. I've already beaten that horse to death. Um, if you like what we're doing and you'd like to contribute, you can you can do so via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Iron I think is the URL for that. And I think that's a show for tonight. So, everyone, have a good night. Hi, everybody. All right, good show. We're still live for the moment. Just this is the point where I like to say to everyone who may be watching on YouTube, even though there's no one currently, <laughs> thank you for watching. Um, if you're watching us after the show, thanks for tuning in and sitting through this, uh, I don't know, hour and a half or so of podcast. Good Lord, so, uh, really. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It was such a good time, though, wasn't it? Mm. Hour, hour and 41 minutes on the recorder. I don't know what ended up on YouTube, probably an hour and a half. So, yeah, thanks for watching and have a good night, everybody.